It's wonderful for us to get together for these days and share the Lord together. <clears throat> In the highlight of uh, Israel's history, when they had their temple and the Ark of the Covenant in the midst of the Holy of Holies, and the Shekinah glory upon the whole city of Jerusalem. It was a precious time to come up to the feasts and to hear the word of the Lord and to see the blood of sacrifice and to feast together. And so we have this privilege to gather in the same way. A holy convocation where the Lord calls us to recall all that he has done. And we've asked the Lord to give us a special portion of his spirit for these days. Because there's a necessity of revelation for us to see beyond the, the doctrines to the reality. That we might see by a spirit of wisdom and revelation our Lord Jesus as the victor over Satan and over all that stands against the purpose of God. We need that vision. And to see again by the Spirit that the issue with us is our spiritual life, which the enemy is prowling about, seeking to steal from us. Uh, if we in any way become, uh, lack vigilance, as the Lord has asked us. So we need the Spirit of God to wake us up to the conflict and to the awareness that there is still the stealer about who is willing to take anything out of your life that would uh, make you less than the Lord's purposed destiny for you. We further need the Holy Spirit when we look at this whole matter of overcoming. There is a tendency, I think, because it's, it's such a high and noble matter for most people to feel like, well, I think I'm going to have to go up to heaven in the second load. I don't think I'm really quite this overcomer. But we see in the seven churches the Spirit in a winsome, wooing way, calling for every Christian to hear what the Spirit is saying. And we pray for an inclusive Spirit here this morning, that everyone would hear that Spirit call to overcome and rise up by faith. Because indeed, it's a noble fight. And we must enter in by faith that our Lord Jesus, who has overcome, will grant us victory. And so we come and ask the Lord for this special portion, because even this morning as we talk on this wonderful matter of the overcoming by the blood of the Lamb, what a tremendous topic. And because of the, even the nature of the tremendous matters we're speaking in in these several days, all of the speakers, we realize that the enemy would try to distract. If he can make us just even this morning, put us into neutral, make us passive rather than active listeners, oh, then, then he's gained a little something, temporarily at least. So let's not be passive. But let's enter in. We know the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. Some of you sleeping well in any circumstances. <laughs> Some not sleeping so well and hoping for a snooze this morning. <laughs> but no. Let's ask the Lord to quicken our mortal bodies by his Holy Spirit. And especially awaken our hearts to hear what he wants to say to us regarding his tremendous victory. We want to read just some scriptures together here this morning and begin in Exodus in chapter 12 to the time of the Passover. We'll just read some verses. Uh, we all know about this tremendous moment in Israel's birth and history. Uh, just we'll begin in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 21. Then Moses called for all the elders and said to them, Go and take for yourselves lambs according to your families and slay the Passover lamb. You shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood which is in the basin and apply some of the blood that is in the basin to the lintel and to the two doorposts 
and none of you shall go outside the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to smite. And you shall observe this event as an ordinance for you and your children forever. When you enter the land which the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall observe this right. And when your children say to you, what does this right mean to you? You shall say, it is a Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians but spared our homes. And the people bowed and worshipped. And then just the first two verses in chapter 13. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Sanctify to me every firstborn the first offspring of every womb among the sons of Israel, both of man and of beast, it belongs to me. Hebrews chapter 9. We'll begin in verse 11. Hebrews 9, verse 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that since death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. For a covenant is valid only when men are dead. It's never in force while the one who made it lives. Therefore, even the first covenant was not inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and the goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. And in the same way he sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry with the blood. And according to the law, one may almost say, all things are cleansed with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And then finally, just our verse in Revelation chapter 12, and verse 11. And they overcame because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life, even unto death. Let's just have one more word of prayer. Lord, we come. We're so thankful for this holy convocation. We pray that your glory would be upon us, that your spirit would work upon us, convincing us of all that our Lord Jesus has done to gain full victory. And we stand today for full victory. Young, old, new Christians, veterans, all overcoming by the blood of the Lamb. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've done on your side. We could ask for no more. 
We ask now for living faith and our consciences sprinkled with blood that we may serve the living God in these last days. Help us, Lord. Strengthen us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen. We come back to Revelation chapter 12. We see throughout the book of Revelation that there's a tremendous conflict. Whether it's seen down on earth in the seven churches, uh, from whom the enemy is stealing things like first love, we see that there's a spiritual struggle. And yet here we have this wonderful, wonderful song of victory in chapter 10, uh, 12, beginning in verse 10 of Revelation, where the loud voice from heaven declares the victory has come. And included in the victory is the part that is played by these overcomers, humans down on earth in this correspondence of earth and heavens, and somehow involved in the victory that is uh, casting out the enemy. What a great victory this is. But to see the humans have a part in it. Now, we know that there's a correspondence between the things that go on on earth and that which is going on in heaven. We remember from Daniel how often he prayed and waited because there was conflict just overhead in the heavenlies regarding spiritual matters of God's purpose and destiny. And so we find in our own prayer times as we gather as saints together, oftentimes our prayers seem hindered and, and oppressed, and we find we have to do battle, and then we discover something in the heavens has been loosed or bound by the prayers of two or three gathered together in concert by the Spirit. And so the Lord has these overcomers and in the end, they shine and give all glory to the overcomer in whom they overcame. Now, who are these great overcomers? How do you picture, do you picture them in your mind? Are they avatars? Are they titans? Transformers? Superheroes? If Hollywood wrote this story and ever told this story, which they would never do because they are ignorant both of Scripture and the power of God, but if they tried, they would pick some guys with these big shoulders and mighty muscles, you know, with that kind of uh, V-shaped body. <laughs> They'd all be wearing those kind of bandanas. And these are the overcomers who come down and, of course, in Hollywood, I doubt they'd ever show these overcomers coming down and just slashing to ribbons Hollywood itself. But anyway, it's another story. <laughs> this is Hollywood's fantasy. This is not God's overcomers. It gives much, much, much more glory to God and to the Lamb that he chooses little ones those of little reputation, broken ones, abandoned ones, outcast ones, not the noble ones of the earth, as if some sort of superhuman group of Christians, but just anyone who will come may come to Jesus. And he takes this ragtag bunch gathers them in caves, even as David did in the days of his uh, fugitive years, and takes these people of no account and turns them into mighty men by the inspiration of his character. And somehow Jesus takes these, these small ones, these little ones, these weak ones, these broken ones, and he turns them into mighty men in the spirit. There are traits of these overcomers that the brothers have been talking about in these days, such as the Lord uses the circumstances surrounding the person's life to actually shape them in the warfare and strengthen them. And so rather than take us out of the world into monasteries where we might overcome, 
On the contrary, he puts us right in the world where we face the pressures and the persecutions and the vexations of people cursing every other word and saying negative things and tearing down God's name. And in all of that, the Lord uses that environment to strengthen you in spirit to do the warfare that needs to be done. Now, only God can devise such a way, but the Holy Spirit is a famously wise engineer of circumstances. And he knows just what we need to strengthen us. And that's why some of you are in a pretty hot place at work or in your particular situation. Another thing that we've noticed and heard our brothers share is that the overcomer is beginning to learn how to live by the life within. While on this earth, but he's learning to live by that heavenly life. He no longer lives, but Christ lives in him. And he's learning more and more how to abide in that life that is within. Rather than try to wrestle against flesh and blood with flesh and blood, he's found anew in a different way. And he's learning how to overcome. And in that process, unconsciously to him, he's beginning to bear the testimony of Jesus. Because people see Christ overcoming in him and in her. A third thing we notice about these overcomers is they want to gather together with others and find strength in two and three. We sometimes have this idea that overcomers pretty much are standalone lone rangers who just read their Bible and pray and fast and every once in a while come out of the wilderness, speak a word to the rest of us and hightail it back into the country somewhere. But no, you know, the true overcomer knows their weakness, but knows the strength in gathered two and three. And isn't it interesting we find overcomers in all seven of the churches. Frankly, you and I might not like some of those churches. We'll be surprised when we find overcomers coming out of churches and assemblies that we had written off. But they're gathering. Perhaps not as the whole church, perhaps not in a living way as a whole, but there's two or three here and there who are learning the secrets of prayer. And that's the fourth thing that I would say. The overcomer has found a strange relief valve in their lives. Everybody, everybody, believer and unbeliever in this present time of tribulation is feeling the pressure. The pressure at work the pressure of finances, the pressure of circumstances, the pressure of corruption, the pressure of politics. Everybody's feeling that. But there is a way of relief. And the overcomers finding this way of relief through prayer. And so the overcomer is coming into a life of prayer where burdens are placed upon them and they learn how to cast them upon the Lord. And then other burdens are placed upon them and they learn again to cast them on the Lord. And in this process, they gain a sensitivity and, and, and are able to interpret some of these vexing circumstances about them. Oh, the Lord gives wisdom to those who are learning the life of prayer. Now, you notice I didn't say they decided to be prayer warriors. No, but they found this to be their relief as they prayed. And so the Lord would lead all of us, those who are weak and those who are small, and those who've been broken, and those who the world basically says, useless. And the Lord is making us into overcomers and giving us such a testimony that we can say, we overcame. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb. What a wonderful thing to say. Now, I want to speak specifically on this matter of overcoming by the blood of the Lamb, and so I want to go into a little bit of the background of this, realizing that there are those here who can certainly speak on this matter much more capably than myself. But there are others here who are perhaps younger. And perhaps, well, I, I don't want the blood of the Lamb to be some sort of a mantra, a magic word but something understood with spiritual intelligence, just what we mean when we say we overcome by the blood of the Lamb. Then, of course, we see that, the re that this is at the very start of these three d distinctive things that are mentioned. 
because this is the very foundation of our overcoming. It's because of the finished work of the Lord Jesus represented in this shedding of blood that enables us to stand in the victory and then move from victory with the word of our testimony and laying down our lives. And so the, the blood of the Lamb is the very foundation of our victory. And so it's important to look into it. And if we're to understand how we're to overcome, we need to see what the Lord Jesus overcame when he shed his blood on Calvary. Now, I, there's a long story that we see in the Bible, which I'm going to try to present in a relatively brief way. But it all starts when the destiny that was given to man, man fell short of, a destiny of glory. We know David so wonderfully mentioned in Psalm 8 what man should be like in purpose in creation. He's been created a little lower than the angels, but, but given glory and honor and given dominion over all of the living creatures in the air, in the sea, and on the land. Man was destined to be a prince who uh, replenished, who stewarded the whole of the globe. This was to be man's destiny. And how was he to do it? By being energized both intelligently and with strength by the tree of life. These men were to just take dominion over the earth. This has always been man's purpose, your purpose and destiny. But Paul's very definition of sin is that we fall short of the glory of God. And of course, man was deceived by that serpent of old that we find in the record, who somehow convinced man to rely on self-life rather than the Lord's life, rather than be a prince of this earth, being directed by spiritual impulses from the God of gods, rather to be a self-pronounced prince and do things his own way. Well, of course, when man took that route and said, I will live by my own knowledge and my own soul, immediately man lost the battle. And the, the serpent of old, the usurper, became what Jesus calls in three places the ruler of this world. And what Paul calls in one place the prince of the power of the air. And these terms, we say them often. Now, let's just understand that there's a mystery about the life of Satan and in his present state. There's much we don't know. But from fragments of scripture here and there, there's a tale that goes something like this. In the beginning, this great angel, Lucifer, was perhaps even a cherub of covering, very near that emerald throne in the highest heaven where God sits and those, those seraphim and those angels and elders surround. And he was a, a, a light-bearing angel of the highest order who through self and pride and rebellion was thrown out of the highest heaven and relegated to the first heaven, or the heavenlies, as Paul calls it, where now uh, this is where Satan runs and moves and roams across the earth. He, ro he roams across through the heavenlies. And so he roamed across the earth, and he saw Job. i got to do something about that. So he goes to God, he says, God, that's not fair. See, of course, this is, as it says in Revelation chapter 12, and it's interesting, isn't it? The main power and activity of Satan is his ability through lying and etc. to accuse. Do you notice the main thing they say about the devil here in this? Who accused the saints before our God day and night. This one's been cast down. Now, they could pick a lot of other things the devil's done but especially to believers. He is relentless in his condemning accusation. Well, there's a reason for accusations. Because this 
enemy now subordinated down and under God's permissions has to look and find a reason to steal, kill, and destroy. He can't just do it. If he did, we would all be gone. But no, he has to treat man with respect, and it's all hands off unless he can find an uncovering, unless he can find an accusation, an excuse, a reason to sift or otherwise to harm. So he's always looking, looking at man, looking at Job, saying to God, ha, Job, what a phony. He's being hedged in by you. You're cheating. That's the only reason he likes you. See, this is the devil, always accusing. We know in Zechariah, uh, in the book of Zechariah, in chapter 3, he stands before Joshua, the high priest, saying, look at him, shame on him, filthy, filthy, filthy. And there's Joshua saying, filthy, 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 until God comes along. What an accuser, night and day, 24-7 accusator. You don't need to call him up for an accusation. He's been right there putting something in your ear. And this is his business. But when he can find an accusation, then he's got a right to put his hand on you. Yet, very humiliatingly, only by God's permission. And so a man has lived that way since Adam fell. Living in darkness, Satan ruling over the world, Satan using things in our lives to weary us out, to make us heartless, make us hopeless, make us vegetables. But even in the garden, the Lord began to leave a testimony of life. But now it must be life through the shedding of blood. Man had rejected the tree of life, but now could receive life, but only through the shedding of blood. And so even before Adam and Eve were thrown out of paradise, the Lord saw that these God-fearing people, Adam and Eve, they could not bear the shame of their sin, of their nakedness. It wasn't the fact that they were naked that bothered them. It wasn't the fact that they were going into cold Iran outside of paradise that needed them wearing these clothes. The Lord mercifully covered their shame by the shedding of blood as he gave them these coats of animal skin. And so man began slowly in the perceptions of his darkness. The Lord would shine in a beam of light and life would come when there was the shedding of blood. And so we see several years later, Abel offering his offering by blood to the Lord. And suddenly, some kind of indication, registration that God was pleased with the sacrifice. Now, it's not that the Lord had rejected Cain, but it's as if the Lord says, that's it. You can worship me that way through the shedding of blood. Instructing men that there is a way. Men who fear God and want to worship him, there is a way, but it's through the shedding of blood. And so Noah learned. When once again the ruler of this world had brought this place to such filthiness that God said, let's destroy the whole thing. But Noah, the, righteousness, the righteous one, somehow found faith, favor with God and obedience. And when he came out on the other side of the flood, you know, God made a covenant of mercy. He said, I'm going to let you live. I'm not going to drown you again. But it's through the shedding of blood we sign this covenant. And the story keeps going. It's the same story. When Abraham came and God began to speak to Abraham, as he moved from place to place in the promised land, he would stop. And this revelation he saw of this Jehovah, he wanted to respond. And what did he do? In every place he built an altar and with the shedding of blood offered a sacrifice and worshiped God. And God and Abraham began to talk together. 
And if you look closely, it's just after those sacrifices, many times, that's when the Lord actually spoke to Abraham. And one time, God said to Abraham, I'm going to give you children like, this, like the stars of the sky and the sands of the sea. And Abraham, who'd been walking with this God, not as close as you and I can walk, by the way, gaps of 13 years between conversations at times, but when God said, I'm going to give you children in a land and bless you, Abraham believed. And it was counted to him for righteousness and ratified as they laid out animals in the shedding of blood. And God covenanted with Abraham. But Abraham became a friend of God. And we all know that story, too. He became the friend of God when God said to him, sacrifice your only son. Because there was a lesson for the sake of history to be learned. Sacrifice your only son. And you know, Abraham went to sacrifice his only son, but learned the value of his son when the Lord said, stop. There's a ram. Jehovah Jireh provides. Blood for blood. Your son is free. And you're my friend. Oh, to be a friend of God often seems to involve sacrifice. But Abraham learned as he walked in this way. Men down through history have learned these lessons, that there is some measure of spiritual life, that there is some intelligence and understanding of God, but only through the shedding of blood. But the Lord wanted to make this truth known to a nation, not just individuals. And so we know the story of the Passover, which we read. And here the Lord said, I want to give life to my chosen people. And it will come through the shedding of the blood. Take that lamb and paint that blood on the top and on the sides of the door and stay inside. And when I see that blood, I will pass over you. And Israel was born as a nation in that precious blood. Even as the death angel passed over Egypt and they were sorrowing and crying all over the place. In those particular homes, they were eating the lamb and thriving on the very thing that was painted over their heads. Oh, what a lesson they learned that day. They were saved. They were redeemed. They were covered by the shedding of blood. And then not long afterwards, the Lord brought them into uh, the uh, wilderness and began to talk to them some more. I want you to have life with me. I want you to be a, a, a peculiar people. I want you to be a nation, a holy nation set apart for me. I want you to be kings and priests. Now let's make a covenant by the shedding of blood. And oh, what a covenant they discovered. This covenant was tremendous. Why? They, they, they found that there was very particular, but there was a way to find forgiveness from sin. It was through the sacrifice and the shedding of blood. They found that they could be atoned with God. And all of that guilt and sin rolled away once a year by the shedding of blood. And they discovered that they could fellowship with the Lord by going to his tabernacle, but entering through the shedding of blood. And they discovered that they could feast with the Lord and be blessed by the Lord and experience his presence through the shedding of blood. And so that's why we read, and we'll turn to that in the Hebrews in chapter 9, where, it's, where it comes to a conclusion. In Hebrews 9 and verse 22. And according to the law, one may almost say, all things are cleansed with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. 
This is the conclusion of the writer of Hebrews as he says that in the Old Testament economy and according to the law, there was life. There was life that could be had. There was life in relationship to God. There was life and blessing. There was uh, freedom from guilt and, uh, and from sin, but it would come through the shedding of blood. Now, that's the conclusion. And you see, we today um, ask the question, now, why is that so important? I had a professor in a Christian college who stood up in front of the class one day in a, in, a, in a religion class and said, this whole matter of the blood of Jesus, we should just purge it out of the Bible. This whole thing of vicarious atonement by blood, it's bestial. It's, it's savage. It's uh, something done by primitives. We now know God forgives because he loves. We don't need these tokens anymore. Well, I'm glad they kicked them out of the school a few years later. <laughs> but that's how many think. Why talk about the blood anymore at all? Many young people probably wonder, what, what, what do we need all that stuff for? I thought we'd been singing, God loves me, cares for me. What, what's all this stuff? Why is it only by the shedding of the blood? It seems like a good question. But the question is based usually on a, upon a problem, and that is, we are so self-centered that we have no idea how important it is for God to be satisfied. We live under the very life and government of a holy, righteous, loving God. And the blood has very much to do with God being satisfied with us. <laughs> and here we see how full of self-righteousness we really are, <laughs> where we actually think, you know, I can go to God and talk to him. I think he likes me. <laughs> and this is the common experience, certainly here in America anyway. I think God basically loves me and likes me. And the people are always amazed when something terrible happens, and why did God let it happen? It should just be, you know, good, good times with God. And there's a lot of Christian uh, um, cheerleading sessions and rah-rah sessions that are basically, hey, let's have a good time with God. You ready for a good time with God? Hey, let's have a good time with God. No thought of blood. No humiliation of who we are, save for the blood of Jesus. We may just say some slippery words and enter in, but blood's very important to God. You see, because blood is life. It's the value of life. God, since he put that tree in the garden, the tree of life, he values life, real life, spiritual soul, body life, life. Man throws life away when he says spiritual life is not important. And now man wants to come to God and, oh, just be ushered in with his soul. But no, there's life. And life is in the blood, and life is the issue. And there must be some kind of answer to that life that is holy and unimpeachable. And this is the basis of Satan's accusations. The fact of the matter is, before we came to Christ, we couldn't come to God because Satan had our number. And if we would dare try to go to God, Satan would say, he can't go to you. He's got sin in his life. And the accuser could start to tick off those things in your life because he has been running a videotape on you and me. You can't come to God because of this and this and this and this. And those accusations by our lives cannot be met by things like, well, I'll try to do better. Because there's already impurity in our blood. There's already poison there. There's already that which is bringing us to death. And there's no way through unless there is some virtuous blood, some perfect and holy and unimpeachable blood that can answer to the accusations of your life. And that's why the Lamb of God came. Because Jesus offered his blood. Perfect sacrifice. Holy unimpeachable, virtuous, and he offered that blood for you. That's the only basis of any exchange there could be. 
It's not without the shedding of blood that we come into the presence of God. It's always been so. And of course, down through the course of history, as we've seen all of these moments where man had a glimmer of understanding there's life through the shedding of blood, we see that the Lord has been pressing into the history of man the testimony that there's been a lamb slain since the foundation of the world. That shedding of blood testimony was a testimony of something that would happen when this Jesus came. And so he came. Praise God. He came. As John said, the Son of God came, uh, appeared to destroy the works of the devil. Oh, boy. The devil had his day when Jesus stepped on earth. And John looked at him and said, there's the Lamb of God. Isn't that amazing? Oh, such a great prophet. What a great prophecy. Nobody could see that, this young man coming down toward the Jordan. And John saw it because it's what he'd been praying for. This is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And oh, Jesus stepped out in that water, pure sacrifice, and offered himself. Came up out of those waters into the wilderness, tempted by Satan, defeated Satan, bound the strong man Satan, and began to set the captives free. What a powerful, powerful Jesus, pure. And as Jesus came to the end and he knew that he was going to Calvary momentarily, he mentioned this ruler of the world three times. It's worth us looking just to see what Jesus says regarding this ruler of the world. We find the first one in John chapter 12. As the hour is near, as the Gentiles are coming to seek Jesus. Jesus begins to speak about a grain of wheat that falls in the ground and dies. But we see there in um, chapter 12, in verse 27, let's pick up there. It's in verse 31, uh, the reference to the ruler of this world. But here we go. Now my soul's become troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And a voice came out of heaven. I've both glorified and will glorify it again. The crowd of people stood by and heard it, and they were heard it thunder. Others were saying, an angel has spoken. But Jesus said, this voice has not come for my sake, but for your sakes. Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. The ruler of this world is about to be cast out. Jesus prophetically makes this statement. Oh, how that ruler shuddered. Because then the very next thing he said about the ruler of the world in chapter 14 and verse 30 I will not speak much more with you for the ruler of the world is coming and has nothing in me. Now, let me tell you one thing about the devil. He's the inspector general. If anybody can find anything, anything uncovered, anything wrong, any attitude bad, any inward rebellion, the enemy could find it. And the enemy had been inspecting Jesus every moment of his earthly life, and it says, the ruler of this world has come, of course, to take authority over me, and he has nothing in me. Oh, <laughs> you talk about a frustrating ruler. He can do nothing in he can't touch Jesus. When Jesus goes to the cross, he goes on his own. The devil can't touch him. He has nothing in me. No accusation. What's your accusation about Jesus, devil? Well, he was born of godly parents. There's no accusation. And then again in chapter 16, as he talks about what will happen after he leaves and the Holy Spirit comes in his place. And it just simply says in verse 11 of chapter 16, and concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. And now the Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts. When this ruler of this world tries to come and condemn us, and the Holy Spirit says, 
There is therefore now no condemnation to them in Christ Jesus. And the ruler has been condemned. Got no further right to condemn. He's been condemned. Boy, the Lord's really turning this thing upside down. Well, we know that our Lord came and offered his blood, died on the cross. We see, we know from all four Gospels, this eternal moment on earth, which, of course, has a correspondence in heaven, as all things eternal do. And as Jesus died on the cross and was buried and rose again, up in heaven, Hebrews tells us what really went on. Up in the heaven of heavens, up in the heavenly tabernacle, something transpired of eternal value. So we should go back and read it again in Hebrews in chapter 9. Just a few verses there. We'll just read verses 11 and 12. But when Christ appeared as the high priest... Now, this is the most amazing revelation because on the one hand, Christ was the Lamb of God who died and offered his blood. Up in heaven, he's the high priest. In the highest of heavens and in the holy of holies. And now the high priest comes. He entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. That's all that needs to be said. Our Lord went and offered up his perfect, virtuous, unimpeachable blood once for all for the sins of all mankind. What a sacrifice. What an awesome moment in the highest heaven. What a tremendous corresponding impact down here on earth. Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. And he rose up again according to the scriptures. And he ascended at the right hand of the Father according to the scriptures. And they who believe in him are cleansed by his blood, are washed by his blood, are saved by his blood, are given life by his blood, are sanctified by his blood. There's, there's words that fill the rest of the New Testament just to describe what happened when that precious blood was shed. And they're only human words. The reality is greater than the words. If we just look at a few words that deal specifically with his precious blood. Jesus said, ransomed by his blood. He said, I have not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom. Imagine that. You've been black. You've been kidnapped. That's what the enemy did to us. He kidnapped us and sent out a ransom. Say, who can pay for this person back? Jesus came with his blood and ransomed us and took us back. Praise God. So encouraging to hear about this precious sister in India who somehow escaped the kidnapper's hands. And we've escaped the greater kidnapper, one who would kidnap us to hell. And yet, yeah, we've been ransomed. Isn't that a wonderful word? And then Paul twice uses this phrase to describe what happened by his precious blood. You've been bought, straight out bought with a price. Oh, what a great price. And actually, we're no longer free. As our brothers have been shank. it's wrong to say, you've been bought with the price, and now you're a Christian, now you're free. Well, okay, I understand that. Because we're free from guilt. We're free from shame. We're free from the stain of our sins. We're free uh, because we're alive. But no, no, here's the real, well, uh, maybe I'll hold it for a little while. We're bought with a price. Now glorify God in your body. You remember that word that man was destined for glory? And, and that we went, Phew! that was the shortest airplane flight in history. <laughs> Adam destined for glory. 
and that's you and me. But now you've been bought with the price and destined for glory. There you go. Oh, wonderful bought. And then we look in uh, Romans chapter 3, because there is a uh, uh, coming together of uh, three words in this beautiful little passage, wonderful gospel passage in Romans chapter 3, all as, uh, with the central thought of the blood. In, the <coughs> in Romans chapter 3, we see uh, verse 21. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood, through faith. Now the Lord displayed through his blood and these three things became our reality. We've been redeemed. And there again, the Greek word is speaking about is a word used most commonly by slave markets where a slave is redeemed and set free from the slave market. We've been set free from the enemy, redeemed by his precious blood. It says, furthermore, we've been covered, this propitiation. It actually says mercy seat. And you and I have been atoned by that precious blood. We've been covered by that precious blood. The devil can make any accusation he wants. Who can condemn? God has justified. And you can just see that bubble of his precious blood covering us in that mercy seat. And that third word there, justified. Let me put it another way. It means made righteous. By his blood, we've been made righteous. I, th this is incredible. We had no righteous life until Christ died for us. But now we, he, we've been made righteous. In other words, let me make, put it positively. The devil has no right to us anymore because we've been made right by God. We've been brought back to paradise. We've been brought back to the tree of life. We're learning to live the right way. We're learning about that life that came through his precious blood. This is salvation, redemption by his blood, justification by his blood, propitiation by his blood. What a wonderful salvation we have. The enemy has no power over these things. And that's why you cannot read the book of Revelation without every once in a while that heavenly chorus breaking out in a song about the precious blood. We just look at one little passage in Revelation 7 because there's a question behind this uh, passage. In Revelation chapter 7, we see this group assembled. <clears throat> and uh, just leaving off the wonderful worship of this wonderful group, we come to verse 10, uh, 13. Revelation 7, verse 13. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, These who are clothed in white robes, who are they? Where have they come from? And I said to him, My Lord, you know. And he said, These are the ones who came out of the great tribulation. And they've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason they're before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tabernacle over them. And the story goes on. But you just see, their robes have been made white by the precious blood. The, the, the question that's implied behind this uh, little dialogue between the angel and John is this. Who are these people up in heaven and what right have they got to be there? To which the angel answers, they have a right to be there in the presence of God, worshiping day and night because their robes have been made white by the blood of the Lamb. And thus they can be worshipers and enter in freely into communion with God. Wonderful the blood of Jesus and what it's done. And the wonderful thing about that being made white by the blood of the Lamb, it's not talking about something that happened after you died. That uh, precious blood that makes our garments white is not something that happens once you go up to heaven and you're given some robes. This is something that happened when Jesus died on Calvary and you believed in Jesus. 
and you were saved, and you gained robes of righteousness by grace. Praise God. Well, now you say, oh, okay, well, now we've been all over the Bible and talked about the blood, but now how do we overcome by the blood? And for this reason, I just bring you back to the picture of Passover to mention three things this morning. We'll talk about some other practical matters next time. But three things this morning that are absolutely essential to overcoming by the blood of the Lamb. And the first one is this. The Passover's requirement was that you take this blood from this precious Passover lamb and you paint the sides of the door and you paint the top of the door and you stay inside. Now that takes faith. And it furthermore warns, don't go outside until morning. You stay right there. Now the first practical exhortation of how we overcome by the blood of the land is this. Stand in the blood of the lamb. By faith, it's finished. You're covered. You're not the devil's property anymore. You are God's. You belong to him. You need to stand there. That's the first thing. Now, that takes faith. Just standing still and seeing the salvation of God takes faith. We're sure there's something we really need to do. But the first and important thing is this. Just stay under the blood. Stay under the blood. And so we come to this exhortation of Paul, who in a completely different way is drawing us into the same subject when in Ephesians chapter 6 he talks about the necessity of standing in victory. How do we do war, spiritual warfare? Ephesians chapter 6 speaks upon this matter. And all the armor and all those things... But let's just notice his emphasis here. In Ephesians chapter 6, and in verse 10, he brings up this matter of this tremendous spiritual warfare right over our heads now with these principalities and powers. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand, you notice, firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenlies. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand. And then the next verse, stand, 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 stand. The devil comes roaring. Now, the one thing he has, he may have no teeth, but he's still got a roar. And he'll come prowling, and he'll come roaring, and he'll come condemning, and he'll come accusing, and he'll come threatening, and he'll even threaten to take your physical life. He might kill the body. He can't take your life anymore. He cannot take your life. And you will not die. And when your physical body ceases, your life goes right on. It's settled in heaven. It's done by the precious blood of the Lamb. But oh, that lion comes around. Now, when we hear a lion, we tend to step back. Don't step out from under the blood of the Lamb. Don't begin the question, oh, well, well maybe I'm not saved. Oh, but he, he says, you're not saved. Look at you, you crummy Christian. Oh, 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 yeah, I guess I'm not. And then right out of the house you go. Stand. That's the first thing to do. And you know what it will be said of us? We overcame. And all we did was stand in the truth. Well, we stood with our loins girt with truth. We know this. I belong to God. The enemy can do whatever he wants to me, but he can't touch me unless God lets him. I'm here, under the blood. Are you there? Under the blood. Stand there and resist the enemy. And you'll find that he'll just get hoarse and go away for a season and come at you again, some new angle. Stand. Stay in the house. Stay under the blood. That's the very first thing. Well, praise God for that. But wait, there's something more. I don't know if you caught those two verses in Exodus chapter 13 that I read, just in passing through. But this was a result of the Passover. And after the death angel had gone overhead, 
And after the deed had been done, and after Pharaoh had told the children to get out of Egypt and they were delivered, then the Lord said, now, now we've got some dealing to do. Consecrate every firstborn. They belong to me. The blood of the Passover lamb spared the firstborn. You see, that was the judgment. That the firstborn in every family and of all the cattle in Egypt would die. Now the firstborn in all the houses of Israel were spared. Now God says, I spared them, they're mine. And the original intention was that those of every tribe who were firstborn would be given to the Lord in priesthood. In a wonderful way. Given to the Lord willingly as a as thanksgiving to God for sparing. Uh, I, I remember uh, when I was a kid, I had a friend, and I went over to a friend's house one day. Uh, we were all high school kids, about four or five of us, and, and uh, suddenly I, I saw this beautiful woman. Ooh. Now, she was the older sister of this girl, and I said, well, who's that? And they gave me her name, and I said, well, how come we never see her? And they said, well, she's the oldest girl in our Catholic family, and so she's going into the sisterhood. You know, Catholics believe this. They used to. You took your oldest kid, and they went off to become a priest or a nun. I, I, it, it stunned me. I never knew anybody gave themselves to God. I, at that time, I wasn't a Christian. I, I knew nothing of this. I was pretty impressed because she was a beautiful girl. And she was giving it all away. Well, here we are. We're bought with a price, but not our own. And so here's the second way we gain the victory is by consecrating ourselves as a living sacrifice on the altar to God right now, under the blood. That's where it is. Consecrated. Sanctified. You've been sanctified and separated by God. Now live in that separation by offering your life and the members of your body to God. You know Israel's folly. Here they were, separated by God from the world and sent out of Egypt. And what did they spend half of their idle hours doing while in the desert? Oh, Egypt. Oh, how we love the dim sum in Egypt. <laughs> they were lusting after the things of Egypt. And they were just, uh, oh, just moaning and growing and dissatisfied with destiny as God's possessed and special children because thinking about what they're missing back there. And, of course, you know, the enemy gives lying memories. Oh, you remember the good times? Whoa, before I got saved, sometimes the Lord reminds me of how bad some of my good times were. The enemy lies about it. Oh, you remember the good times back there? You want to go back to Egypt, don't you? What folly that was. Here they were. They could be pressing into the Lord and getting to know more of him, and all they're doing is sitting around saying, oh, man, I wish I had some of that good uh, Turkish tobacco. <laughs> so you see, it's not just enough to stand in our, uh, the reality and the truth that we've been under the blood of the Lamb, but then to consecrate ourselves, body, soul, and spirit given to God, separated to him. Forget that stuff. And as our brother Lance said last night, if the Lord says, let it go, let it go. We're on another journey now. It has nothing to do with Egypt. But if you don't stand in consecration, then we have to talk about the third and final thing. Because in the Passover, inextricably bound with the Passover, is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That is to say, we need to be purged of any evil, of any flesh, because it gives the enemy a place. It gives the enemy leverage. And so these things must be purged. I'd like to show you a, a final scripture here, and then I know we'll close. But in Psalm 118, that famous psalm, that psalm used in festival, that psalm that is a testimony of David and the Lord's grace in his life, there's just some words that to me fit this exhortation that I want to give, and it's this. Number one, we stand, and having done all, stand under the precious blood of Jesus. 
Number two, we consecrate ourselves, body, soul, and spirit, to serve the living God. Number three, we cut off all encroachments into our life. Now, let's just see this. Here in this wonderful psalm, David is speaking. He's been made king, we believe. Uh, this is David, and he has been given great responsibility. No sooner was he made king of the kingdom under which God could rule, but the enemy came to attack. And we just had these three pronouncements down in verse 10. And the nations surrounded me. Now he's the king. Now what does he do? Even before he goes out to battle, he says, In the name of the Lord, I'll surely cut them out. And again, they surrounded me. Yes, they surrounded me. Now, this seems to indicate they surrounded in waves of enemy troops. In the name of the Lord, I will surely cut them off. And again, they surrounded me like bees, no longer even assembled in order, but swarming, coming in at it from the left and the right and back and before. And what does he do? In the name of the Lord, I'll surely cut them off. Now, how could he say that? It's because he knew his position. He knew he was in God's kingdom. He knew this was for God's glory. And he made those pronouncements. In the name of the Lord, I cut it off. In the name of the Lord, I cut it off. And you know what happened when he said that? Indeed, the Lord cut it off. Because there's a correspondence between what you say in faith and what the Lord does in heaven. Look at those immediate verses up in verse 15. And the sound of joyful shouting and salvation in the tents and of the righteous. And here's the testimony. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. Now what is he saying? For every in the name of the Lord, I cut them off. The Lord's hand came and cut the enemy off. He had to say it. The Lord had to do it. It's the right hand of the Lord to cut off the enemy. But he had to say, in the name of the Lord, we cut them off. And then the Lord did that. Isn't that a marvelous picture for us? But brothers and sisters, before we end today, we need to be honest about encroachments. Because many of us who know the Lord, some for a long time, some pretty new, the enemy works night and day to steal things out from under you, to encroach upon your territory. And unless you cut it off, it begins to compromise and spoil your whole life. You find that uh, if, the Lord, if the enemy can just steal something, the encroachment develops to the place where we lose heart. Perhaps even lose that testimony that the Lord told us to guard by the Holy Spirit within us. He has sanctified us. He has put us on holy ground. But we need to be careful that the enemy doesn't encroach things into our life. Now, has he encroached, made encroachments into your life? Sometimes it's big things. Sometimes it's small. Sometimes we allow him, because we're angry, to encroach in our marriage. Oh, that mom and dads would say, in the name of the Lord, I cut him off regarding their children. We know how the enemy tries to encroach into their young lives. Does the enemy encroach into your heart with some vain things, with some unforgiveness, with some uh, illicit uh, uh, lust or, or idea? Oh, how we've heard so many testimonies, among young people especially, of the encroachment of the enemy through the internet. And he can take your mind right out of sanctity in the Lord and bring it into filth that quickly just by dabbling in some kind of a Google where something looks interesting. The enemy always starts out with little encroachments. Starts out with little things. Your devotion time. Oh, you've gotten too busy for that, have you? I don't care if you've known the Lord 40 years. If you're not spending some time with the Lord taking that stand in the day, you're losing the battle. And you need to say, in the name of the Lord, I cut off anything, TV, books, uh, sleep, anything that's going to rob that from my life. 
little tiny things. Oh, I'm so busy. You know, there's some people who have a shrine in their cars. Now, they have no time to get along with the Lord. So they get in their car, start it up. They're listening to a tape from some preacher. They got a book out on the side. Every time they're parked, they're flipping over the daily devotion thing. And they're reading two devotions on the web. But I don't care what other people are webbing to you. I'm asking, are you devoting yourself to the Lord? Don't, don't use those kind of excuses. Well, I, oh, yeah, I got my two devotions in, and I, and I read the chapters. Well, I didn't really read them. I listened to the tape of the two chapters. Oh, I know, and I was making a phone call while those tapes were playing. <laughs> it's a very subtle thing. Some people allow their thought life to be encroached. Some people allow their medications to get out of hand. Some people allow that casual drink to become a dependence. These things are serious matters. And you can be a Christian 50 years, but the enemy is finding some way of getting you out from under covering and some basis of accusation and some basis to give you heart failure. All oh, the Christians could have a testimony. I'm in the Lord. I love the Lord. I'm, I'm sacrificed to the Lord. And I cut off in the name of the Lord anything that, if I see it, I cut it off. We need victorious Christians who understand the power of the Holy Spirit. You cut them off in the name of the Lord and watch the right hand of God do it. You know, there's things that have gotten into our lives that we basically have given up on. Ah, it just doesn't work. Ah, I've just given up. Ah, oh, there's just no hope. And, he, and the many could testify. After being niggled and bothered and haunted for years, there finally came a day where you just said, in the name of the Lord, I cut it off. And he cut it off like that. And you wonder, what was I doing wrestling with that obsession? When all I needed to do was claim where I live and claim who's my Lord and cut it off. And we won't come to spiritual reality in our Christian lives. We can sing that wonderful song, the blood of the past over lamb, that we're blue in the face. But if we're not living in the center of it, we don't know the spiritual reality of it. And frankly, if we're not, the enemy is overcoming us. He's got something on us. And you know how he can blackmail. He's got something on us. Yeah, I mean, there's, it's incredible to say that there's Christian men in adultery. The Lord's got it on them. You, you think that man's going to serve the Lord? Well, he may be deceived enough to try. But something will be exposed. It'll damage the whole church. And it's an encroachment. Oh, there's so many tragedies that we see all about us. There's no need to go into it. But if we want to stand in the victory of his precious blood, we need to get honest with God. I'm not going to ask you to stand up here and acknowledge your encroachments. But I think you need to stand up before the Lord your God who supplied the holy blood of his son Jesus Christ to sanctify your life. And I think you better talk to him about that which is encroaching. In your weakness, you be as honest as you want. But you tell him the truth. And you ask for grace to cut that off. And you watch what his mighty hand can do. Just give him the chance to produce holiness in your life. And stop fooling with it. And of course, do I even need to go and say the encroachments that the enemy has taken into our assemblies? Half-hearted love. Devotion that's um, measured, secret resentments, and all of that sort of thing that just makes fellowship life a lousy experience. Oh, that we might learn how to love one another. You know, because of the weakness of your own flesh, how likely it is that others are struggling as well. Can we be... Uh, covenanted together in mercy to pray for one another's deliverance, to pray and help one another rather than just judge one another, pick on one another for those things that bother us. Well, as you can see, there, there's so much that the enemy can do to us, but there's such a simple solution. We're under the blood of the Lamb. And you know what that means? It means the Lord values you so much. Now I know we fail, we're weak, we're sinful, we're uh, unprofitable servants, 
where there's a value to God that he sees in you and I that deserves full consecration. Our dear brother Ed Miller wrote a little chorus five years ago maybe, and he asked me to put it to a tune. Well, I put it to a tune. It's pretty lousy. But the chorus is, is beautiful. He just gave me these little words. He loves me because he loves me and proved it on Calvary. If value is made by the price he paid, then the Lord made a treasure of me. If value is made by the price that he paid, then the Lord made a treasure of me. Do you realize, dear saint, you're God's treasure? You're his riches, you're his treasure, you're his hope for his son. Oh, he wants to buff us up and make us ready for the Lord. All glorious gems and treasures. That's the value of the blood. Don't demean the value of the blood by saying, oh, it's useless, it's hopeless. Well, the enemy's got me. Oh, no, he doesn't. Not if you belong to the Lord Jesus. Let's just have a moment of prayer. Just to consider encroachments. Could be little tiny things, but they're stealing away our overcoming life. Oh, Father, we come to you. We thank you so much for your precious Son, the dear Lamb of God. We see that his victory is settled in heaven and that you rest and are satisfied. We see in the Passover that as you look over that house, all you see is writ there on the house, mine. We see as the devil looks upon that house, all he says is, don't touch Oh, thank God we live under the blood of the Lamb. And we want to stand firm and stand there and having done all to stand. We want to put on the Lord Jesus Christ as our provision, his precious blood, his righteousness, all that he is to us. We put it on to stand firm in this evil day and declare you're our Lord. And we want to respond not by lusting for Egypt, but by pressing it with consecration to be those separated children that you're pleased with. But, Lord, we acknowledge encroachments. It shames us to say we can call ourselves things where all the time the enemy's got an edge, a leverage. He's got us one up. And we say, Lord Jesus, for the sake of the testimony and for the sake of your glory, we cut him off in the name of the Lord. And we ask that your right hand would do gloriously. Oh, Lord, how we need to be saved. Oh, thank you for your precious blood. Let its blood prevail over us. Even that tremendous power of life in your blood. Let that blood give us that life of righteousness that we so desire. Oh, help us, Lord. We cry out to you for mercy. No more encroachments. We'll have nothing to do with it. We live in the house of the Lord, and we're under the blood, and we cut those things off that we might be wholly yours. Lord, we pray with humility, realizing the value of your Son. In Jesus' name.